In a recent development, a New York appeals court has firmly rejected Donald Trump's latest attempt to postpone his civil fraud trial. This decision paves the way for the trial to proceed as scheduled next week. After the conclusion of the first week of the trial, some gripping revelations have emerged, courtesy of Jeff McCann. The comptroller of the Trump Organization, who took the stand and made a stunning admission, the valuations of Trump's properties were not inflated by accident but were. Prior to this trial, there had been allegations that Trump was artificially inflating the value of his real estate holdings, including his apartments and golf courses. In fact, intentionally manipulated. Attorney General Letitia James had presented evidence supporting these claims to the trial judge, who had already found the Trump Organization guilty of fraud. However, the latest testimony has provided an in-depth look into the extent of the deception within Trump's business dealings. Last week, Judge Ann Yoron ruled that Trump had exaggerated the value of his beach club by an astonishing 2,300 percent. One particularly eye-catching example is Mar-a-Lago. According to Trump's financial documents, Mar-a-Lago was valued between $426 million and $612 million, predicated on the notion that it could be sold as a private residence. However, recent revelations indicate that this premise was a complete sham. The deed for Mar-a-Lago explicitly states that it can only be used as a social club. Consequently, its true value may be significantly lower, estimated at $18 million to $27.6 million according to Palm Beach County's appraisal. Another glaring instance is Trump's renowned penthouse apartment in Trump Tower. Prosecutors questioned McCann about the value of this opulent residence, which Trump claimed was worth $180 million. However, a comparable Manhattan apartment with additional features, such as a waterfront view and an alleged royal owner was priced over $100 million lower than Trump's valuation. McCann, the Trump Organization controller, argued that the $180 million estimate was based on square footage, asserting that Trump's lavishly adorned apartment spanned 30,000 square feet. However, the judge in the case refuted this claim, asserting that Trump's triplex was closer to 10,000 square feet, making it significantly smaller than the allegedly cheaper apartment. To gain further insights into these revelations and the implications for the ongoing trial, we are joined by Christy Greenberg, a former federal prosecutor and former deputy chief for the Criminal Division of the Southern District of New York. These revelations are nothing short of astonishing. Christy, thank you for being with us. Were you taken aback by the audacity of these property valuations? Christy Greenberg, this information aligns with what the judge outlined in their order last week. It's noteworthy because the judge emphasized that this is fundamentally a case based on documents. The case of perpetrating fraud through falsified documents, the enormity of the discrepancies between Trump's valuations and reality is striking. The defense may argue that property valuation is subjective, more art than science, but the numbers presented here are so far removed from any reasonable appraisals that it's egregious. Now, as the trial delves into other counts, such as insurance fraud, falsified business records, and falsified financial statements, the crucial element is proving intent to defraud. These must be materially false statements that someone, whether a lender or insurer, would have relied upon to grant favorable terms. The defense's position that property valuation is inherently subjective and therefore not subject to intent to defraud is questionable and, frankly, illogical. In the case of Mar-a-Lago, for instance, Claiming its worth as a private residence when the deed expressly prohibits such usage is a clear departure from reality. The judge rightly described it as entering a fantasy world where deeds and objective measurements cease to matter. It's hard to justify such discrepancies as mere differences in opinion or valuation methods. Interviewer, absolutely, especially when you consider that Trump seemed to play both sides of the coin, devaluing de properties for tax purposes and inflating them when seeking favorable loan terms. Trump's double standards in valuing properties, depending on the context, raise serious questions about his intent and the credibility of his valuations. Christy Greenberg, precisely. It's difficult to argue that such actions are not indicative of an attempt to manipulate the system for personal gain. Interviewer, some have raised the notion of a Trump brand premium, suggesting that properties bearing the Trump name carry a significant value boost. Could there be any merit to this argument? or is it merely an attempt to justify the indefensible? Christy Greenberg, 
The issue here lies in the dual representation of a property's value. Trump's approach appears to be opportunistic, portraying a property as having a high value when it suits him and a lower value for tax purposes. This inconsistency erodes the credibility of the Trump brand premium argument. It's not a matter of brand value, it's a matter of manipulating valuations to serve personal interests. It's challenging to argue that these valuations are legitimate when they fluctuate so dramatically based on Trump's needs at any given moment. Interviewer, thank you for shedding light on these critical aspects of the trial, Christie. It's clear that the trial is unveiling a pattern of deception that goes beyond mere exaggeration. Christy Greenberg, you're welcome. The discrepancies in property valuations highlighted in this trial raise significant questions about intent and credibility. As the trial progresses, it will be crucial to determine whether these discrepancies constitute a deliberate effort to defraud, which could have severe legal consequences.